The church flag on the first Sunday signifies a pause for prayers. After the last mass, and after the Protestant and Jewish services, the off-duty sailors have but one thought. Transportation has but one terminal, the mess hall, the best dinner of the week, as ancient Navy tradition always has decreed. Admirals and captains wait their turn in the chow line with the men. Inside, plates are loaded. Roast beef, rich gravy, high mounds of mashed potatoes, flaky pie. Life looks up again. A cigarette, good coffee. Five miles east of Little America, a seal herd, 500 strong, has its feeding ground amongst pressure ridges and in deep crevasses. Ricky, as a pup, played the game of run, seal, run, and he hasn't forgotten. The seal wallops with his tail. Ricky's 12-year-old teeth are not so good on the slippery, wet hide of the 600-pound Waddell. Mr. Seal decides he's had enough. He scuttles down his escape hatch to the water below. Chow time. The only seals killed are for dog meat. Especially good because it ensures against scurvy. The pups smell their dinner coming and let their handler plainly know they want it. Right now. They're only a few months old and forever hungry. Yet soon they will be pulling more than their weight in the sledge traces. They like their meat red and will fight for it. The flagship flashes word by radio to the carrier Philippine Sea. Base ready, weather suitable. On the carrier, six planes, triple checked, are ready for their moment of destiny. Admiral Byrd has given the pilots a final briefing. Everything depends on split-second timing. Pilots, man your plane. No 3,000-foot runway here. Only a scant 300 feet. Jet propulsion is their reliance. Crewmen attach jet containers, four to a plane. These JATO bottles are packed with flaming power. In the critical 10 seconds at takeoff, they give the kick-up of two added engines. Bird is airborne in exactly 100 feet. Admiral Byrd and his companion plane will try the 800-mile flight first. The others await his orders. At Little America, cameramen and Admiral Cruzen wait anxiously. There comes Byrd. Cruzen can relax now. The skis work perfectly. The carefully calculated drag of the wheels serves only to shoot up a plume of snow. Byrd greets his son, Dickie Jr., first, here following Dad's footsteps. They watch plane number two come in safely. Bird tells Cruzen, good to be home again. But Cruzen has urgent news. There's a terrific storm brewing, only 10 hours more of safe flying. Bird radios the carrier. These men are the first ever to fly big planes into the Antarctic. Or on previous expeditions, the planes were freighted in, assembled, and only then were they flown. These Navy and Marine Corps flyers have been bred on stormy going. Their long experience and all the Navy's relentless training in all details brings them in and despair. The blizzard hits 100 miles an hour scouring across the Sestrugi. In storms such as this, many brave explorers have died. must be hand-dragged, hand-pumped, hand-fed, with the temperature far below freezing. The chow wagon, the never-failing CB tractor, gives the work parties a lift back to the mess tent for hot coffee, food, and warmth. Only the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Army cameramen who made this official record know the price they paid for these blizzard films. They covered the Pacific battles for posterity. This cold day, they froze their winters to make these first films of an Antarctic blizzard. Little America digs out. The planes still stand on the line uninjured. Icicles and snow to be cleared off, but no plane blown away. Lashings held. 
tense city intact proved out the technique of survival evolved by Bird in a lifetime of exploration. Not intent when. No matter how great the pressure of work, the flag must be raised with a ceremony which is its due. Admiral Byrd declares Little America the Fourth in full operating commission. The Admiral and the party ride weasels 12 miles south to visit his earliest camp for the radio towers. Little America the First, now 40 feet under the snows of 17 years. And above it, Little America the Second, 25 feet under the snows fallen since 1935. Captain Boyd, United States Marine Corps, ties on a safety line. While Admiral Byrd and three veterans of his previous expeditions watch, Boyd inches his carcass down the old ventilating hatch. It stood 20 feet in the air when it was put up 12 years before. He pokes a stick up as a marker for the main hatch. Now all hands, the Admiral included, will have a chance to go look-see. Below, the old-timers find a lantern that lights at once and all manner of other gear. For here in Antarctica, there is no decay, no rust, no dust, not even germs. Fruits, vegetables, meats, all good after 17 years. Small wonder Bird preaches that one day, Antarctica may be the world's storehouse to keep the seven years surplus for the seven lean years. Bird, bringing with him the old corn cob he'd forgotten in 1930, comes up last. He meets heavy going, but he makes it the hard way and seems to like it. Aboard the Mount Olympus, the Navy tries out one of the most important experiments assigned the expedition. Can men survive in freezing water? Men from Mars, members of a special underwater demolition team, wear the new cold water rubber survival suit. In contrast to these skylarking youngsters eating ice cream in the ice, men in ordinary clothing are paralyzed in six minutes and die very quickly thereafter. Yet these sailors, wearing only underwear beneath their survival suits, stay in half an hour and come up chipper and warm. On the sunny afterdeck of the Mount Olympus, the expedition's prize penguin catch, the big emperors, are living the life of penguin Rileys. They grow four feet tall, weigh up to 80 pounds, and are the only creatures who live throughout the year on Antarctica. Eons ago, they flew. In time, their wings evolved into swimming fins. Their deep feathers are the warmest known. Their feet, thick leather-like pads. On these, they lay their single egg and tuck it up within the body feathers for warmth to hatch it. In captivity, they must have their vitamins. Keeping them alive for the return voyage is quite a problem, for their bloodstreams have no germ resistance. Their necks are ball-bearing. Strangely enough, the smaller captive penguins prefer their fish fillet. They won't eat live fish out of a pail. The rockhopper penguins are the clowns of the Antarctic. 20 inches high, cocky yellow eyebrows, sassy, and forever hungry. As the men find out, they'll eat their weight in fish every three days. The gathering of scientific data ranks high in expedition plans. Admiral Byrd says goodbye and good luck to an over-ice expedition which is to probe deep into the Rockefeller Mountains 300 miles southeast. Two LVTs hauling supply sledges strike out into the white darkness, their mileage checked by bicycle wheel counters astern. In the mountain rocks, they will seek minerals and ancient petrified vegetation. Hourly, they will record important aerological data. But exploration by plane has priority one. A million and a half square miles are to be explored and mapped, and the oncoming winter soon will end flying weather. The wheels come off for both takeoffs and landings on the ice must be made by skis alone, delicately balanced to feather in the wind, yet strong to stand the shattering shock of landings. Organized exploration on a scale hitherto undreamed of calls for precision timing. Each plane is serviced on exact schedule with 1,200 gallons of high test gas and with preheated oil tested to function at 80 below. A pressure tank, especially designed for operations in deep cold, pumps the oil into the planes. Daily flights begin. 
Each plane has a definite sector to explore, a definite timetable, a definite radio report schedule. While the weather holds, flights operate around the clock. For emergencies, the LVTs cash provisions and fuel at the limit of their range. To aviators forced down, to rescue planes sent out to bring them in, these cairns may offer the one hope and may mean ultimate survival. 1,200 miles to the east, the eastern group vessels and planes are exploring the mysterious Phantom Coast. Aboard the destroyer Bronson, the commander of the eastern group, Captain George Dufek, makes an exploration voyage. He sails close in to Mount Erebus, 14,000 feet above the sea. It is the only known active volcano near the South Pole. Captain Dufek, his mission accomplished, returns to rendezvous with the seaplane tender Pine Island. Personnel transfers to the destroyer must be made by breaches buoy because of rough seas. This officer would probably prefer a boat. The deep roll and the destroyer's outward flaring bow force the handling crew to wait for the exact moment to haul inboard, lest the man be dashed against the ship's side and killed. It is Captain Dufek's turn next. The line is set higher. The seas run stronger. The ships roll dangerously apart. The line slacks, then snaps taut and breaks. A 50-foot plunge downward. Dufek disappears. Away, rifle! Men jump to stations. Lower away. Hurry, hurry. Eight minutes in this icy water means death. Speed is the only hope. The boat shears clear. Heads out fast to the rescue. Captain Dufek reappears. He has managed to inflate his life jacket. Seven minutes gone. Dufek grabs the lifeline. The seaman clutches him. By a margin of seconds, he is saved. 1,500 miles west of Little America, the Currituck and her western group are off the Shackleton Ice Shelf, circling the Sunset Coast. The Western Group Commander, Captain Bond, gives pilots and plane crews a last briefing on Antarctic dangers and the technique of survival if forced down. The flight about to start is the longest and most important so far for the Western Group. Before takeoff, survival gear is checked, gear to keep nine men alive for 100 days. Food, drugs, sleds, sleeping bags. On the water, the great PBM makes her takeoff run. Her jet assist bottles blast. She lifts quickly into the air and circles the Kuratuk once. Jet assist bottles, their work done, are dropped and make a salvo splash. The pilot, Commander David E. Bunger, wipes his frosted windshield, a constant source of trouble in polar flying. He is over the Shackleton Ice Shelf, named for the great English explorer who kept returning to the Antarctic until death so often escaped, kept its rendezvous with him. The smooth shelf roughens. Dark rocks, called nunataks, appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Bunger leans forward in amazement. His eyes have caught a sudden and unbelievable change in scenery. The universal white has turned to chocolate brown dotted with blue. A cameraman goes into action. 300 square miles of land without snow. Land that might be in New Mexico or Arizona. Pictures alone will prove Bunger has discovered a warm oasis in the shadow of the pole. It is for such supreme moments as this that men brave the hardships of exploration. The astounding, undreamed of fact is that they are over a chain of warm water lakes whose shores, except for small patches, are free of ice and snow. Commander Bunger circles the largest lake in sight, five miles long. He comes in to make a landing. Water temperatures must be recorded sample is taken. He finds the water fresh, the temperature 38 degrees Fahrenheit. On the shores are vast deposits of coal and of minerals of the utmost importance to civilization. Aside from their headline discovery, Bunger and his men have another good reason for hustling home to the Currituck. A long-awaited ceremony is in progress. The whole fleet awaits news of the all-western beard derby. The Currituck skipper, Captain Clark, is judge. His salute of the day is 
Right corner mustache. Twist. The captain awards prizes to the winners, enlisted men and officers alike, the champions in the first Antarctic beard derby. To the most handsome. For the bushiest. To the officer who tried the hardest. To the neatest. To the most unique. To the red all Kuratukian. And to the one with the most sex appeal. At Little America, a warning sounds. The fleet is in sudden danger. It is being frozen in. It may be locked within the Bay of Wales. Here is the treacherous foe. If caught, the ships will be wedged against the barrier, crushed. Here will be the graveyard of the fleet. Icebreaker North Wind goes into action, ramming, backing, ramming again to break up the crushing flows. Landing craft work frantically to loosen the ice around the ships so propellers may turn without shearing off. One by one, the ships are cleared, yet underway. Bird remains behind with 197 volunteers and grave problems. His most important exploration flights will now lack the powerful directional radio of the Mount Olympus. To get his men out, he must hope the icebreaker can crash her way back in time. Otherwise, he and his men will be frozen in for the nine sunless months of the dark, treacherous Antarctic winter. Marooned, Admiral Byrd and his staff plan the big flight to the South Pole and far beyond. This is the culmination, the last mass flight. Four planes spanning out over a continent of unknown territory larger than Texas, California, and Arizona combined. Over freezing wastes without people, without life, without vegetation. Nature's most formidable challenge to man. The four planes are gassed up. All controls triple checked. Motors heated. For they face cold as extreme as 60 below. Unrelenting, murderous. Photographic units lead the parade of science to the planes. Each is a flying laboratory. The cameras are the trimetrigons and the K-17s that spied out enemy secrets during the war. Now each plane carries 250 pounds of film to record some of nature's last great mysteries. The war's secret radar magnetic detectors are here too, bolted on like bombs. In war, their electronic impulse is spotted minefields buried deep under the surface. Now they will read far below the ice detect and identify minerals, coal, iron, and precious ores. Bird gets the words, ready, sir. He boards the leading plane, gives the command, take off. Crews hasten to rock the ships and thus free the skis frozen to the ice. Now all the work that has gone before, the planning, the task of preparing ships, of training men, the perilous voyage through the ice, now all of these investments of time and sometimes of suffering are coming to focus. Takeoffs for non-stop flights over the desolate, danger-studded wastes of Antarctica. Flights of great distance, the equivalent of, back at home, winging non-stop from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Aviation is all important in the Navy's Antarctic exploration. Just as aviation is all important in a modern Navy that must be strong under and above the sea, as well as on it. Out over the shelf ice, Bird leads his four planes in the long climb over pressure ridge areas, heading for the polar plateau, 10,000 feet up. Below are no landing fields, only deep crevasses, pressure ridges 100 feet high, instant destruction for a plane forced down. Bird pioneered the first South Pole flight in 1929. He applies again the practice of constant vigilance, careful calculations that assured his earlier successes. Over this cruel country, Bird flies today at three miles a minute. In earlier explorations, three miles in one day was frequently the utmost for Shackleton and Scott for Britain, Amundsen for Norway, and Bird himself for America. The Beardmore Glacier, 200 miles long, 50 wide, a thousand feet deep, who knows? Bird checks position by the sun compass. The glacier signals the South Pole itself. Here, Bird drops the flags of the United Nations, carefully boxed, a symbol of America's goodwill to all nations. Now beyond the pole, Bird focuses his cameras and magnetic detectors on land new to him and to all mankind. In eastern group waters, 
the seaplane tender Pine Island swings out a plane. Listed on the fleet's roster as Mariner George One. Crew members look out. No shadow of coming disaster troubles their young faces. Captain Caldwell, observer. Lieutenant J.G. Frenchy LeBlanc, pilot in command. Lieutenant J.G. Bill Kearns, co-pilot. Ensign Lopez, navigator. And a crew of five take off to map the treacherous phantom coast. Birds' planes deep into the unknown are the eyes of civilization, recording, evaluating, mapping. Plateaus, mountain ranges with peaks 20,000 feet above sea level. The trimetric on lenses clicking overlapping exposures every three seconds photograph from horizon to horizon. Coal, a mountain of coal. Bird later declares Antarctic mines, if once tapped, could supply the world's coal needs for centuries. These official motion pictures can give only a cross-section of the miles of photographic records accumulated on this expedition by the Navy. The exposed mapping film will take five years to assemble. Amplifying these are the radar magnetic detectors, accurately recording mineral discoveries of immense value for the future use of all mankind. England, Norway, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, South American countries, and Soviet Russia are claiming Antarctic territory. The United States recognizes no claim, and so far has made no formal claims for itself. But international policies cannot concern the Admiral now. His duty is to keep his flying laboratories functioning, to fulfill his dream of a lifetime. The word, gas half gone, sir, comes from the engineer tabulating fuel tank readings. Bird radios his pilots, return to base. By the third leg of their triangular course, the planes head back for Little America. Bird's plane takes the widest swing fuel permits as the lenses of the Tri-Mets continue recording new territory. This is the last big flight. Bird is determined to record the maximum possible. One by one, the planes swing in over Tent City. Flight operations checks them in and safely down. Plane two, plane three, plane four. But not plane one. Bird's plane is yet to be accounted for. Bird is missing. Out over the ice, Bird is in trouble. His starboard engine is cutting out, now stops. His one remaining engine is losing power. The altimeter needle starts dropping down. The plane is losing altitude. All 4 D1 to base, all 4 D1 to base. Position Q5, engine out, losing altitude. The base prepares for rescue operations. Handicapped by the partial power of one engine, the plane is in jeopardy. Down she drops. The needle drops from 3,000 feet downward, threatening peaks around her. A further drop might mean a crash. Only one hope, reduce the load, lighten her at once. Maybe that way, maybe if enough weight goes, maybe she will hold. Already the mountains are above. She is deep in the valley, deep in the shadow of disaster. The needle drops downward from 1,700 feet. Jettison all gear. Only the precious films and records are saved. The gamble is life or death. Altimeter levels off at around 900 feet. Slowly she starts to climb. She is gaining altitude. The pilot signals 4 0. Three hours later at the base, the crippled plane comes into sight. Men peer closely, tense, hushed, as they see the starboard prop dead. A one engine landing is tricky at best. With skis on ice, Hold your fingers crossed for the pilot. Safe, safe, good going. The greatest exploration flight of all history has ended in success. The flight beyond the South Pole. The flight beyond imagination.
But over the Pine Island with the Eastern group is the shadow of tragedy. Captain Dufek flashes the word by radio. To Eastern Task Group, from Task Group Commander, Mariner George 1, overdue. This group commenced standard search and rescue operations immediately. Grim men with grave news from Captain Dufek. No time now for jubilation over his own escape. No mood for rejoicing. Bird knows better than any man the tragic import of the message. In the freezing danger of the Antarctic, seconds are hours. Minutes are days. Every resource of the expedition must be mobilized instantly. All planes must take the air. All men stand alert for emergency duty. Over the ice pack, above the open sea, across the barrier. Mariner George 1 is down with men. No radio signals coming through. That means a crash. Search. 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 Wherever the plane is, it must be found. For maddening, anxious days, fog shrouds the area where the accident most likely took place. Men are frantic. Yet daily, at their own request, at their urging, in fact, the crew of the Pine Island gathers for prayer service. On the 13th day, the weather breaks clear. Dufek sends another PBM into the area heretofore shrouded in fog. At last, in clear visibility, the pilots and men scan water and pack ice along the Phantom Coast. Wherever they are, the nine men of the George I have been lost almost two weeks. Hope is thin. Five hours out, Commander Howell, the pilot, spots smoke, a signal fire. Some are alive down there. How badly hurt? How many live? George I smashed. The wreckage scattered, some of it burned. And a message on the wing. Lopez, Henderson, Williams, dead. No seaplane can land on the ice. Can the survivors reach open water? Howell must drop a message. We'll land barrier's edge 10 miles north. We'll drop flags to mark trail. If you can walk it, form circle. If not, form line. Howell knows the gravity of the decision Captain Caldwell must reach. But if the men can walk, a day may be saved. A precious day for the engine. Howell flashes the news. Captain Dufek gets the word and gives it to the Pine Island by loudspeaker. Attention all hands. This is the task group commander speaking. Mariner George 1 has been sighted. Rescue operations are in progress. Howell circles his PBM over the wreckage. He watches for his answer. The huddle of men breaks apart. They've reached a decision. It's a circle. They'll try the 10-mile trek to board the PBM at the water's edge. Howell's crew have the relief gear ready now for the men below. Cargo chutes float the heavy packages down. First aid boxes, rations, skis, blankets. For men hungry, cold, hurt, and losing hope, the chutes are as lovely as shining stars. Symbols of life restored, of return to families who've been waiting and praying. Now to mark the trail. The PBM's crew have hundreds of flags, each weighted to land and stay upright. If fog should again close in on this desolate coast, there must be no second disaster, no wandering from the road to rescue. The survivors follow the trail markers. Five able to walk, one on a sled, 10 miles to go. These men are marching out of the shadow of death into the sunshine of life. Aboard the rescue plane, ready to leave the barrier edge, the survivors, six thankful men, jerk out their story in bits and flashes. How Henderson, Lopez, and Williams died in the crash and explosion when they smashed up in milk bowl visibility. How they found scattered cans of food, a stove, and fuel to keep it going. And one tube of sulfur tablets, just enough to keep Frenchy LeBlanc, their gravely injured pilot, barely alive. Proudly, they tell how Captain Caldwell consulted them all in dividing their little food, how he kept watch, inspired their faith, and how they prayed, as men always do, when there is no other hope but prayer. Bill Kearns, co-pilot, grins hello. First off is Frenchy LeBlanc. Corman carry him tenderly in a stoke stretcher. Moore and Robbins pulled him out of the blazing nose of the plane, but his back, hands, and face suffered third-degree burns, and in the Gethsemane of waiting for rescue, both legs were frozen to the knees. Amputation is inevitable, but he will live. The ship's company of the Pine Island greets their skipper, Captain Caldwell, observer on the flight.
He says no ship ever looked so good to him as his own command. And again, he sets foot on her decks. His executive officer greets him with sincere affection. Captain Dufek warmly welcomes the survivors. Co-pilot Kearns, his broken arm in a sling. McCarty, photographer. War, the radio operator. And smiling Shorty Robbins, the motorman. Ahead is warm. A hot bath, clean sheets, and long hours of restoring sleep. And perhaps first, a moment to splice the main brace, by which good sailors mean a ration of medicinal spirits. Bourbon to you. Later in sick bay, all but Frenchie and Captain Caldwell enjoy their first full meal in two weeks. Kearns will go to Georgetown University to study for a career in diplomacy. McCarthy, who has a wife and two children in Sonoma, sunny California, beams happily. Robbins, who was the wheel horse in those desperate days, figures to keep on flying. He still loves it. And War knows that he will marry his school teacher sweetheart back in Reading, Pennsylvania. News of the rescue finds the icebreaker with Admiral Cruzen fighting her way through thickening ice to pick up Admiral Byrd and his men at Little America. Byrd is radioed for all speed. At the base, the Admiral supervises Operation Secure. All essential records and scientific instruments are to be taken home. The planes must remain. They are stripped down with the hope that another American expedition in a future year may find them of use. Supply dumps are marked by poles. And now through the capes comes the old reliable workhorse, the icebreaker. Final loading is the order. All roads lead to the bay, the last trip down. The last long trek through the snow for the big go devil sledges loaded with men and equipment. The excitement that always comes with sailing infects all hands, including the dogs. They sniff something important is in the wind. With normal quarters for 75, the icebreaker must jam aboard the additional 197 men of the base body until, after the voyage north, she can transfer personnel to the big ships awaiting her at Scott Island. Bird is among the last aboard. He can now report to Admiral Nimitz, Operation High Jump completed. Our men have achieved accomplishments unparalleled in the history of discovery. Our central group has flown far beyond the South Pole mapped one-third million square miles never before seen by man. Our eastern group mapped 3,000 miles of coast and charted 40,000 square miles of coastal ocean areas hitherto unknown. Our western group flying hundreds of air hours mapped the 4,000-mile sunset coast, made the amazing discovery of warm land in Antarctica. In all, the expedition explored more than a million and a half square miles. Our scientists, by use of the radar magnetic detector, have pinpointed fabulous treasures and resources of great significance for all mankind. The men who did the job, Navy, Army, Air Corps, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and scientists, are going home. Tired men. The rear guard of Admiral Byrd's intrepid 4,000, veterans of the Antarctic, trained to combat the sub-zero enemy of the polar continent. They're going home to their mothers, sweethearts, wives, children. Strong in the knowledge that they have met the Antarctic's heaviest battalions and conquered them. This is to be their lifelong reward. This knowledge and the Navy's highest commendation. Well done.